2 Corinthians chapter 1. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 1 to 14. This will be the third time I'm coming to you. This is Paul speaking, of course. This will be the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time, and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me was not weak towards you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, that we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, <coughs> but that you should do what is honourable, that we may seem disqualified. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the authority which the Lord has given me, for edification and not for destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I sometimes uh, say to my partner in the street outreach, here we go again, a couple of fools for God. That's what you feel like when you go out. Listen to these words that Wendy read from the first chapter of First Corinthians today. For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So according to God's word, standing here before you this morning, I'm engaging in an act of foolishness. I'm God's fool to be engaging in preaching today. That's what the word says. But if we go to the last chapter of 2 Corinthians, we can see just how serious it is to be involved in gospel preaching, even if it's foolish. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 appeals to us all with these words. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So how serious is that really? Very, very serious. To be saved for eternity in the presence of God or to be disqualified, and that means to hell for the same eternity. It's final. How serious is that really? Because of the seriousness, someone once said that every time a preacher preaches, he should preach as though it's the last time he's ever going to say anything from the pulpit, the last time he's ever going to preach. That's how we should preach. It's that serious. So I want to speak to you today from verse 5 and plead with you about some very serious matters. 
as though this was the last time I'm ever going to preach a sermon. I wonder if you've ever heard of George Whitfield. He was a friend and colleague of John Wesley in the 1700s, born 1714, taken to be with the Lord in 1770. And under these men and just a few others, God worked a wonderful awakening, a spiritual awakening in Britain and in the American colonies. Whitfield, in 34 years of open-air preaching, covered all the large towns in England, some of them several times, and most of the small towns as well. He visited Scotland 14 times, Ireland only twice. Seven times he crossed the Atlantic to preach in the American colonies. And the amazing response to his foolish preaching, it was foolish, that's why the church banned him. The amazing response to his preaching helped lay the foundation for the Christian culture in the beginning of America and in its unique constitution. It came out of Christian principles that came from this awakening. It's estimated that in 34 years, Whitfield preached publicly 18,000 times. One single week, he received letters from a thousand people concerned about their souls, wondering how to be saved. What should they do, they said to him. A thousand letters in a week. And in the same week, he admitted 350 new believers to the fellowship of the Lord's table. He went into the open air when the Church of England basically refused him entry to their churches, even though he was an ordained Anglican minister. His first sermon in the open air was at Bristol, Kingswood where he preached to the completely ignorant coal miners as they exited from their day's work in the coal mine. He only knew that his preaching was effective when he saw white lines running down the black faces of nearly all the men through the coal dust that covered their cheeks. I wonder if the Gospels ever made you cry. It's made me cry many times. They cried. Over several days, his listeners became thousands. And these men had never, ever been in a church, nor their families. When he went to London for the first time, on one occasion he went to a large common area and the people came to know he was going there to preach. 30,000 people gathered. And every single one of them heard every word without any amplification. Such was God's gift to this man. He often wept as he preached. He went to be with the Lord in Newburyport, Massachusetts, at age 55, completely burnt out for the Lord. He's actually buried in a Presbyterian church of all places. He went to the Lord after he preached his last sermon from this verse. This is our connection this morning. From 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, pleading with his listeners. I don't know what he said in the sermon. Let me read the verse to you again. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognise this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Examine yourselves, this verse says. Put the spotlight on yourself. Put the searchlight into your heart. Examine yourself under the microscope. That's what it means. What sort of questions should you ask to do this? I'm going to highlight three. And let's remember that Satan is the great deceiver of the human soul. He hates it when God saves a person through Christ. He does everything he can 
to turn a soul away. So don't let yourself be deceived. Don't let Satan deceive you. He hates it. We're dealing with the issues of life and our eternal destination. And there's no coming back, friends. You can't come back for a second try. This is it. This is it. As you are when you leave this life will determine whether you spend eternity in heaven or in that absolutely awful and horrendous place called hell. Remember, there's no entry to heaven unless you arrive at heaven's door in a state of perfection. Good is not good enough. You can be a good person, but when you get there, you have to be perfect. And there's no other way to be perfect except you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ because of what he did on the cross and what he did in his resurrection from the dead. There's no other way. If you're not in Christ and Christ in you, there's no hope. That's the only way. Because heaven is perfect. There's no sin there. We can't take one single sin with us into heaven. They all have to be left behind. All carried on the cross by Christ. Good is not good enough. So who can be saved? Only those who put their trust in Christ and come to know him. So here are some questions to ask yourself by way of self-examination. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith, is the call here in verse 5. Firstly, was there a time, has there been a time in your life when you actually repented? towards God and handed control of your life entirely to God. That's what repentance means. Everything handed over to God. Peter at Pentecost with people under conviction said to them, <coughs> repent, that every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Paul on Mars Hill in Athens said, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. There's no other way in except beginning with repentance. And that means changing your mind. That's what it means literally. Change your mind about God. Change your mind about Christ. Change your mind about the cross. Change your mind about yourself and your own sin. Change your mind about the way to heaven. It's all the change of mind that takes place when you repent. It's an overturning of your life. It has to be that way. Secondly, <clears throat> did I ever really believe? That's a question to ask. Do I really believe? Paul said to the Philippian jailer when he asked the question, how to be saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You and all your household, he said to him. Am I relying on my own works or church attendance? That's a question we have to ask, especially in the church. You may be able to say, I've been to church 15,000 times in my life. I've been a missionary for 30 years. I've never hurt anybody. I have a life full of good works. But all is useless for salvation. It's useless for your salvation. Paul called it dung or rubbish, all that he'd done because it was only through Christ. Millions of people believe in God. They believe that he is. They believe that he created everything. They believe that he sent the Lord Jesus. But you can still be just hoping that God won't let you down in the end. It's a false hope. You'll find a way to save me, you think, if, he turns out, if it all turns out to be true. That's what some people think. It's a false kind of false kind of trust. It's here and now we have to have dealings with God, not when we get there. It's too late. You know Fred Hollows, who served the poor of this world for 30 years, restoring sight to the poor. You know what he said when he was asked if he was a Christian? Very, very sad this. He said, no. But if it all turns out to be true, I'll negotiate with God when I get there. That's what he said. As far as we know, he went with that attitude. 
And if he did, it would mean he perished. John 3.16, we all know it. God so loved the world he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's here and now we have to believe for us not to perish. Thirdly, how do I really know that the faith I have is saving faith? At this point, we just have to ask ourselves, am I born again? Am I born again? Jesus said, if you're not born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God. In John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. You must be. There's no other way. You have to have new life in your soul. Whether it's a momentary experience <clears throat> or whether it's without knowing exactly when, you have to know that you are born again, without doubt. I know one thing about Whitfield's last sermon. He will have stressed being born again. He preached hundreds of sermons on the, the must of being born again. The must of having this dramatic change in your life. Or an evident change that the Spirit of God is at work in your life. All those wonderful fruits that are called fruit, just one thing, one parcel, one Group of gifts, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. You can't have just one of them. You have to have the whole lot if you've really been born again. All the fruit of the Spirit. So we have to have had what we must call a supernatural change in our lives. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. The new has come. It has to be that. No longer do you live for yourself, but for others. You're not attracted to the things of the world in which we live. You'll be abnormal in your thought and action. And finally, God's spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. That must happen and will happen. It's a real experience just as surely as you experience other emotions like joy, sadness, fear, rejoicing, whatever. To have God's spirit bearing witness with your spirit that you're a child of God, you must experience it. You must feel it in your life. There's no alternative. You have to know God's spirit bearing witness with your spirit. That's why the second half of the verse that declares you pass the test when Christ Jesus is in you. Otherwise you're disqualified. Friends, this is not religion. We're not talking about religion here. We're talking about the Christian faith. Religion is what you think you can do for God. That's what all the religions of the world are doing. They're thinking that by following certain practices they can please God. That's not us. That's not Christianity. Christianity is all that God has done for you and your loving response to that salvation. All you do is just a loving response to him. That's why Adam and Eve's fig leaf covering was inadequate. It's what they did to cover themselves. Only when God went and killed an animal and spilled blood and brought the skins and covered them with the skins was the covering adequate. It was what God did, not what Adam and Eve did. That's why the prodigal son was saved and the son inside the father's house was lost for sure. He represented religion. The prodigal son was saved on the grounds of his relationship with the father. Nothing could he do. The elder son pleaded all that he'd done and he was lost. So are you disqualified or do you pass the test? Paul, at the end of this letter to the Corinthians, pleaded with them to drop everything, examine themselves, test themselves if they're in the faith if they were saved. 
Friends, can you think of anything more important than this? I can't. There's nothing more important in your life and mine than to make sure we're saved, to make ourselves ready for eternity through all that God has done. The cemeteries of the world, we could say, are full and overflowing with people who cry in agony, pleading for another chance if they could have it. It's too late. Like the rich man and Lazarus. Send somebody, please, to cool this flame. Go and tell my relatives that they don't come here too, was what he said. You have to take your chance while you're still here, while I'm still here. We've got no choice. And on this Sunday, when we remember his triumphal en entry, let's be honest with ourselves. Beware of self-deceit, because there's no more important matter in this whole world. Don't be content with a false sense of security. When I used to visit the prisons here in Victoria in the 90s, I remember the governor of the Barman Jail in his office, and sometimes I went in there just to greet him, in big print over the back of his chair, Right across the wall of the room was the words, this prison is protected by a false sense of security. And that's what happens to us so often. We think we're protected by a false sense of security. Take time to test yourself. And if you're disqualified, come to Christ in repentance and faith. And in such a way and with such earnestness that you'll be really born again and saved. Become a completely new person in Christ. Don't just be religious. <clears throat> Don't just be a church person, hoping it will all be well. Because it won't be if you don't have Christ in you. There's nothing more important in life or in death for every human soul. And that means you and it means me. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Do it today. Do it this triumphal entry day. Let Christ have a triumphal entry into your life. Everyone must do it. Be earnest. Make sure you're saved. Everyone do it. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <coughs> thank you for all that you've done for us in Christ. It's so easy to say that, Lord, and not even feel it. But we do say it with love and gratitude, still not fully understanding all the implications, still not understanding how it worked, except it does work. You do apply this salvation to our lives. And Christ is in us when we surrender to him. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful work. Thank you that you loved the world so much that you gave your only son. Please help us to live the rest of our days in faithful service, looking to you, trusting you, being your witnesses, remembering the destiny of everybody around us who doesn't know Christ. Lord, that does move us to say something. Let your mercy be upon us too, Lord, as we seek to live for you. Thank you again. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.